you guys remember where Coakley talks about a Trinitarian ontology of desire? Remember this? Reminder to you all from philosophy class. Ontos just meaning being. Logi meaning talk about. From logos, talk. Discourse about being. Ontology is just the study of being. It's the isness of desire. That's what she's talking about. When she says something like the ontology of desire, what she's talking about is what is it actually made up of? What constitutes it? In what does desire consist? What's it made up of? What's its isness? What is desire? That's all she means by that. She thinks that desire begs for, pleads for almost Trinitarian explication. She means by that is when you do things, um, she says this most often about prayer. This is going to be one of the theses that runs through the entire book. She thinks that when you pray, the experience of praying seems to beg for you to describe that prayer in Trinitarian terms. This is going to turn into her theory of the incorporative trinity in the, I think, like two or three chapters from now. Just keep that in the back of your mind. Desire also begs for Trinitarian explanation and description. Here's what she thinks happens. What color should God the Father be? Not brown. I'm making pink. I know, right? We'll have to talk about the Father later. God the Father. What should we be? We'll be blue. Make the spirit green. I don't know why I think the spirit green. Spirit green. It's got to grow. That's good. Our hearts. Okay. Go dum, go dum, go dum, go dum. Okay. The other heart. The line is the Father in and through the Spirit stirs up our desires. Okay. Desire for Coakley is the clue that God incorporates into our constitution as human creatures that leads us back. To God. Desire is the clue built into our human natures, into what it means for us to be human, that leads us back to God. All desire, in a certain sense, proceeds from God, proceeds from divine desire. She says things like divine desire is the progenitor or the source of all human desire. But this doesn't mean that all God is doing is animating our desire. It's getting us stirred up, right? God is also transforming our desires. So God the Father in and through the Spirit stirs up our heart. Okay. You should recognize this is a riff on that desiring anthropology, which we've talked an awful lot about. Going back to Augustine, even earlier, uh, but Augustine's famous words from the Confession, our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee. So the Father stirs up our desires, right? But he's not just stirring up our desires. We're not just getting hot and heavy, right, in this process of the Father stirring up our desires in the Spirit as the Spirit's poured into our hearts. We are being chastened. We are being purged. Our desire, as it makes its way back to God, has to be shot through the sun. And the sun, for her, is Jesus crucified. So the way that she says it is the Father, in and through the Spirit, stirs up and chastens and purges all our desires such that they comport with the likeness of his Son. 
Divine desire is therefore both the progenitor, the source, and the goal of all human desire, and the means of its transformation. Everything else in the book is a variation, pretty much, on this thing. Which is the Trinity, yes. It's the theory of the Trinity. Can we hold all questions until um, after the 20 minutes are over, just so that I can, we can get this and put it on? No, 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 no problem. Um, okay. So this is one of the things she thinks is happening when we enter into those sorts of practices of self-effacement that we were talking about in the first class. The self-effacement of contemplative prayer, what she calls in one of the footnotes of this book, a, um, a sort of naked waiting for in the darkness for God. Where you recall from last time, in contemplative prayer, she thinks that you give up all of your grasping for human forms of power and learn to wait on God. You are emptied. You efface yourself and thus become transparent to God in some way. Through that practice of self-emptying, she thinks this is one of the things that happens, the human literally makes room, well, not literally, I should not say literally, I did not mean literally. The human being makes room for God, and then this happens. The Spirit is poured into our hearts, but the Spirit is not just going to stay there, right? The Spirit doesn't find the home we make for the Spirit in ourselves to be habitable permanently. That home has to be changed, and it's changed by being shot through Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. We are ultimately supposed to look like Jesus. This is how she thinks it happens. And it happens in prayer. Deep prayer in the Spirit magnetizes the soul for God, is what she says. The proof text here is a verse from Romans, Romans 8, 27. The Spirit prays within us for, with sighs too deep for words. We all know this verse, right? She just gives it. She, she would suggest she's restoring to it its erotic coyness. This praying within us with sighs too deep for words is what she calls a kind of proto-erotic impulse, a kind of propulsion toward God. What God always wants to do is God wants to bring us back into union with God's self. And that's what our desire for God is. Is it's a desire for union. And we are totally restless, lost in the wind, until we are brought back into union with God. Until we are reunited with God. So if deep prayer in the spirit magnetizes the soul to God, something else happens in the spirit too. She's worried in this chapter. You can see it on uh, in places like, I think it's page 14, but I don't want to say that and it'd be wrong. Yes, on pages like uh, page 14. She's worried that she's going so far as to suggest that the, the spirit is like the erotic impulse within any sort of desiring relationship that we might find can't be true, because we desire all sorts of things all the time, both people and things, and many of those desires are, if not most of them, are really, really bad for us, right? Bad for us, bad for the things we desire, etc. So she doesn't want to just say, she can't just say that God is the ultimate source and progenitor of all human desires, because clearly there's something wrong with a lot of those human desires. This is where the cross, the being shot through the sun, comes in to this scheme. She says that the spirit breaks. It's really violent language. She said the spirit breaks sinful human desires through Jesus' cross and passion. Such that all that is left after they've been shot through the cross in prayer is a kind of purified desire for union with God, and she argues with other human beings. Now we need to parse that a little more carefully. If 
you guys look at page 14, those of you who have the book in front of you, I'm just going to read part of this paragraph. It's at the very top. So she's talking about here, this verse from Romans 8, 27. Where the spirit prays within us with sighs too deep for words. She says it's, we can understand it as intrinsically erotic in a sort of primal sense. It veritably magnetizes the soul towards God, yet often with the simultaneous danger of a confusion of this attraction to divine love with human sexual loves that in a fallen world may well tend to sin and disorder. Here the spirit is that which propels the one who prays towards union with the divine, but whose tug is felt analogously also in every erotic propulsion towards union, even at the human level. Skipping down to the end of that paragraph. She finds evidence in the contemporary field work that I was talking to you guys about that before, her work with charismatic Anglican congregations. That work finds its way into chapter 4, which is a revised version of the document she wrote for the, the doctrinal commission of the Church of England on contemplative prayer. So in this field work, she says she finds evidence that the spirit may just as much be encountered as that which checks human desires and stops stop their triumphalism. Then she suggests the apparent failure of prayer in the spirit for a desired human outcome may prove to be the pressure towards a deeper and truer perception of the unity of spirit, father, and cruciform son. The son for her always seems, at least in this, when talking about this stuff, to be found in the form of the cross. To put this last point in more densely doctrinal terms, when one thinks rightly of God as Trinity, the spirit cannot bypass the person of the son or evade thereby his divine engagement in Gethsemane and Golgotha. Down there at the, uh, at the very bottom of the last sentence, or next to the last sentence on the page. One might say then of human engagement with God is at its most profound that the spirit progressively breaks sinful desires in and through the passion of Christ. So, sinful desires are broken. So let's review. God is the ultimate source of all of our desires. All our desire suggested kind of period. Desire is the clue that God leaves in our human natures to bring us back into union with God. But our desires are fallen. We desire all sorts of things we're not supposed to desire, all sorts of things God does not intend for us to desire. We desire things that abuse others. You should recognize the parallel with what she was saying last time about the form of kenosis that doesn't grasp for worldly forms of power. She's concerned to prevent the idea that God just underwrites all desire, even abusive forms of desire. How she does that is she says that the Father animates all these desires, and then they are purged and chastened by being brought into the likeness of Jesus through the cross. Every propulsion to union on a human level is analogous to the propulsion to union with God. And they're intimately combined with one another in the practice of prayer. She says often that when you're praying, when you're doing this deep prayer in the spirit, when you're engaging in meditation that's moving toward contemplation, you get all kinds of data that sort of bubbles up from the unconscious. Stuff that we don't like to sit with whenever we sit by ourselves. It bubbles up. You don't know what to do with it. She says that part of that work is the is the painful work of having to be brought into closer alignment with the image of Jesus. That's the pain that she's talking about that you have to kind of go through in Golgotha, where you enter into the passion of Christ in prayer. The goal, though, is divine delight. Okay, so you don't you don't stay right. You don't stay hanging on the cross, right? The goal, she says, is infinite delight. The goal is that your desires would be directed toward God and that your human desires would be purified. She even says that the Spirit makes all of that possible on a human level. She does this on oh, page 24. In admittedly what is a curious way of describing the role of the Spirit within the Trinity. 
she describes the Trinity as I mean, she describes the Spirit as a distinguishing hiatus. So she says at the top of 24, it has been seen through a variety of lenses and perspectives that the spirit is the vibrant point of contact and entry into the flow of this divine desire, the irreplaceable mode of invitation for the cracking open of the crooked human heart. The spirit is the constant overflow of the life of God into creation, alluring, delighting, inflaming in its propulsion of divine desire. Now the worry there is that all that it's going for is union. That it's union at the cost of dissolving distinction. She thinks this is dangerous for two reasons. First of all, there's a version of the mystic way that we've been talking about this year, where the self, the human being, is totally dissolved into God. Totally dissolved. Such that there is no longer any difference between God and the creature. We are just kind of, um, our union with God is sort of like an oblivion, right? And there's certainly quite a great deal of breaking and dissolving, and defacing that's happening in Coakley's work, right? All this stuff about sin needing to be shot through the cross. But she's very clear she doesn't want to dissolve the distinction between us and God in union any more than she thinks the difference between the Father and the Son is dissolved in their perfect union. As I said, this is an admittedly strange way to describe the Spirit in terms of the history of Christian thought. But it is a very interesting one. She says, The Spirit is no less also a means of distinguishing hiatus, both within God and in relation to creation. That's why it makes God irreducibly three, simultaneously distinguishing and binding Father and Son, and so refusing also, by analogy, the mutual narcissism of even the most delighted of human lovers. It would be misleading, therefore, to call the Spirit an echo and protectively to sustain the difference between the persons, thus preserving a perfect and harmonious balance between, the, uh, between union and distinction. The work that the Spirit does is the Spirit both unites us with God and distinguishes us from God. What the Spirit does within our human relationships, by analogy, is exactly that too. The Spirit unites us with the ones we love, but also distinguishes us from them. It's like, oh, okay. Let's just work on the human plane for just a minute. Two human beings, let's say they get caught up in this thing. The will, draw an arrow, this is what's happening. As two people enter into this sort of life, the spirit, both unites them together and at the same time makes sure that the difference between them is not violated. The Spirit is the way to do this, she says. The Spirit allows us to be intimately united with those that we love, spiritually, physically, etc. Two are made one flesh, as Scripture says. But in becoming one flesh, the distinction between the persons isn't dissolved. It's not violated. She thinks that when the distinction between two persons is violated, that's abusive. And she's concerned to provide a way out from that, from a conclusion that would otherwise be necessary on her account of the Spirit as always driving us toward union with God and with each other. I'll take some questions about that in, in a little while because I know it may not be clear. It's kind of hard to this is a difficult part of the book. She'll explain all of this again. We're just trying to learn the two. So to review, we're almost done. To review, God is the progenitor and source of all human desires, period. There would be no desire, no human desire, without divine desire, without God having left this clue in us that always desires union with God again. The Father in and through the Spirit, awakens, heightens, animates, inflames our desire for God. But as our desire for God begins to make its way toward God, it cannot be separated from Golgotha, from the Son. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit always work together. 
what she says. They can never be disjointed. Any act that God does ought extra, she says, or any work that God does in the world. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit always have to act together in some way. It can't just be that God the Father wakes up and at 8 o'clock in the morning and says, I want to go put my image on a piece of toast. And God the Father goes off by the Father's self and puts or his image on the piece of toast. Or that God the Son then wakes up at 9 o'clock and says, I want to go heal somebody. And then God the Son goes off by himself to go heal somebody at 9 o'clock. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit always work together. That's another thing that she's trying to explain on page 14. What this means for prayer is that there is no inflaming of desire without its chastening and purgation through the cross. Once it goes through the cross, once our sinful desires have been broken, they are freed to be directed toward God and toward those we love in the power of the Spirit. The Spirit being that which unites things while also protecting their difference, both within the Trinity and within human relationships, she argues. And you enter into all of this in prayer, the sort of prayer in which the Spirit prays within you with sighs too deep for words. What's important for this, <coughs> what's important about this account for the ecclesiastical crisis over gender and sexuality that she highlighted at the beginning is this is an account of desire, of sexuality, that has not once made reference to male and female. Have I once said man, woman, male, female at all? No. Gender has a role to play in this scheme, but we won't figure that out until the next chapter. She's going to tell us how gender works, but it's not in the way that we normally think that it's going to work. This account of what it means for desire to be holy, for it to be pure, has made no reference at all to the division of human beings into two sexes. 